This is a short presentation on understanding ECGs or electrocardiograms. And this is a presentation that's designated for acute care nursing courses. Uh, my name is Hao Li. I'm an instructor with the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. So the overall learning outcomes for this presentation are to review the cardiac conduction pathway. We will be discussing the lead placement and the views of the heart and then also understanding and interpreting a lead to ECG script, and then also analyzing the common rhythms and their associated nursing interventions. For your cardiac conduction system, the one thing to know is that the SA node functions as the primary pacemaker of the heart. The SA node is located at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Uh, if you follow along the cardiac conduction system, the SA node will go down to the AV node, so the uh, atrioventricular node, then it, the AV node will lead to the bundle his. The bundle his splits into the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch, which then turns into the Purkinje fibers. Other things to be aware of are that the SA node actually has, and the AV node and the Purkinje fibers also have uh, general rates that they actually will fire at in terms of generating a heartbeat. So the SA node generates a heartbeat at 60 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, the AV node will generate a heart rate at 40 to 60 beats per minute. And the Purkinje fibers generates a heart rate at 20 to 40 beats per minute. The thing to know about this is if the one of the previous nodes fails, then this means that the uh, rest of the heart, the other nodes will take over just out at a slower rate. So that way you can still generate a heartbeat, though uh, the question would be as to whether or not you'd actually be able to obtain proper perfusion at that rate and also in terms of the strength of the contraction. So if the SA node fails, the AV node will take over. If both the SA node and the AV node fail, then the Purkinje fibers will take over to generate a heartbeat. The thing to know about the cardiac cells is that they are uh, unique in the way that they have automaticity, which I had mentioned with being able to spontaneously generate an electrical impulse via their pacemaker cells. Uh, cardiac cells are excitable, which means that they respond well to electrical stimulus. They are conductive, which means that they one electrical impulse, will, if the cardiac cell receives an electrical impulse, it will conduct that electrical impulse to the next cardiac cell. And the cardiac cells are contractile, which once they receive that electrical impulse, then they will contract. So if you want to see a good video, short video of the cardiac conduction system in action, you can actually take a look at the YouTube clip that's on the bottom left hand side of this slide. And for your reference, I will also post the YouTube links that I'm referring to in this presentation in the description of the video as well. So when we're talking about the lead system for ECGs, the one thing to know is that the word lead means a view or a picture of the heart. And that doesn't always correspond to the number of electrodes that are attached to that patient. So the electrodes are what will attach to the patient's body to generate the actual ECG. But again, that doesn't correspond with how many views we get at the heart all the time. So in the case of a three lead, three lead ECG, we actually do have three electrodes that are attached to the patient's body, and we actually do have three viewpoints of the heart. However, when you move up to a 12 lead ECG, you're actually getting 12 views or pictures of the heart, but there are only 10 electrodes that are attached to the patient. So that's just one thing to be aware of when we're talking about a lead. It's generally going to be the view of the heart. So uh, the one thing to also know about ECG monitoring is that when we're actually monitoring the ECG, um, in this case, we have a three lead, three lead ECG on the slide. We're actually doing our monitoring via lead two. So when they're talking about lead two ECG monitoring, then that's the lead that we're looking at in terms of ana analyzing the ECG. The reason we're actually going to be looking at lead two is because that actually is, gives us the best picture of the heart's conduction from the SA node down to the ventricles. So if you actually see lead two on the uh, slide right here, you can see that it goes from negative to positive in this direction. And from that, it actually gives us the best picture of the SA node, which starts in the right atrium and then down to the left ventricle. So this is the reason why we're actually going to be using lead two for a majority of our ECG monitoring. 
So this is just a further in-depth explanation of the three-lead ECG because the three-lead is probably one of our more common forms of the ECG that you might see in hospital. As I mentioned before, we primarily monitor and diagnose uh, rhythms via lead two because it, again, it gives us the best idea of the SA node moving through the ventricles. However, we can use lead one because it gives us a, an idea of the current moving from right to left. And then the other thing that we use for monitoring purposes is just the lead three because it gives us an idea of what's going on on the inferior wall of the heart. And we can know if there's any issues with ischemia or infarction there. Uh, because the inferior wall is actually supplied by the right coronary artery, so it gives us an indication for things like myocardial infarction. Uh, you can take a look at the lead one and the lead three and take a look and see what the differences are in terms of how they represent on the ECG pattern. However, uh, again, we do look at lead two as our primary model source because it follows the conduction system the best. This is a diagram of the placement for electrodes on a three-lead ECG. And the acronym that we use, or the phrase that we use to memorize this is white on right and smoke over fire. So what this means is that the white colored electrode will actually be on the right shoulder and it'll be just underneath the clavicle. You'll have your smoke, which is the black electrode on the left shoulder underneath the clavicle. And then you'll have the fire, which is the red electrode and that will sit just underneath your rib cage on the left side of your body. So this is an overview of a five lead ECG. The five lead ECG adds in another view of the heart via what we call lead V1 or, or the MCL lead. What we use this lead for is it actually helps monitor the current traveling toward the ventricles. And that combination of electrodes helps us monitor for ischemia, dysrhythmias, and SVTs, which are, are, is abbreviation for supraventricular tachycardia. So that means uh, abnormal heart rhythms that happen above the ventricles. And examples of that, more common ones, would be atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Uh, you can see on the slide here, the area marked in green on this ECG strip is actually the B1. And the acronym that we actually use to remember this is white on right. Uh, clouds over grass, smoke over fire, and brown. Sometimes you'll hear nurses say uh, that brown is chocolate close to the heart. If you're someone that enjoys chocolate quite a bit, you'll remember that. So some of the pattern for the placement of electrodes will match what we've already seen in 3-lead ECG. So in terms of white on right, we've got white underneath the right shoulder, underneath the clavicle. And this time you've actually added clouds over grass. So the clouds are the white. And the grass is actually the green electrode. And the green electrode will be underneath your rib in the midclavicular line. Then you've got the black again, which is the smoke, and over fire, which is your red electrode. And that matches what we've already done with the 3 lead ECG. And then you'll actually have the brown, which is the chocolate close to the heart electrode. And that's at the fourth intercostal space next to the sternum in the center. So that's the overview of the five lead ECG. So we will discuss 12 lead ECGs briefly here. The one thing to know is that you might encounter 12 lead ECGs in your last year of nursing school if you are doing a preceptorship in a critical care or emergency area. But what you actually need to know upon graduation from nursing school overall, no matter where you're placed, is at least how to read a three lead ECG. So You'll get to 12 lead ECGs as you progress through your career, wherever that takes you. But for now, what you need to know is understanding how to read a three lead ECG. So the 12 lead ECG actually shows you 12 different views or pictures of the heart. And it's actually, there are 10 electrodes that are actually attached to the patient. So four limb leads and six chest leads. And we actually use it to diagnose uh, and identify pathological conditions. So uh, if a patient has a fair amount of comorbidities and perhaps they're going in for a major surgery or a major procedure, then we might do a 12 lead on, uh, on pre-admission in terms of just overall screening. If the patient has a history of uh, cardiac issues like a previous MI, then that's a good opportunity for a 12 lead ECG. And of course, the other thing that we'll commonly ask for with, uh, to ask for to get a 12 lead ECG is if the patient is having acute chest pain. We'll actually use it to rule out any other pulmonary issues gastrointestinal issues or any cardiac issues. 
So I think the most important thing for you to know is when to advocate for a 12 lead ECG. That's probably your primary thing. Uh, the other thing to know with the 12 lead ECGs is that we still do a fair amount of monitoring on the 12 lead ECG via lead two. And as I mentioned before, lead two is what you'll need for the three lead ECG. So if you already have a good understanding of that, then hopefully that will provide a nice solid base for you when you do uh, encounter 12 lead ECGs or learn about that in your future career. So this is a diagram of a normal ECG rhythm. And the term that we use to describe a normal rhythm is the word sinus. So when they're talking about a sinus rhythm or say that the person is in sinus, that means that the ECG is normal. Now, other things to note is the actual uh, waves themselves. And the important waves to know are the P wave. And the P wave actually represents atrial depolarization. You have your QRS complex and the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. The thing to note about the QRS complex is that it actually masks the atrial repolarization because the uh, ventricular contraction is so strong in terms of its electrical uh, readout that it masks atrial repolarization. So that's the reason why it's not uh, apparent on here. So uh, the other thing is that the T wave actually represents ventricular repolarization. So the other thing to note is that there is actually something called the isoelectric line. And that is the baseline where it's a straight line on the ECG paper where there's actually no negative or positive uh, deflections in, ele in electricity. So if I was to mark the isoelectric line on this diagram, it would actually be that gray line directly across. So that would be the isoelectric line that's actually marked there where the actual electrical, con uh, electrical activity is actually zero. Uh, other things to note with this is that uh, this is a diagram of a perfect ECG reading. Okay, so sometimes you'll have to be aware that not all of the ECGs look like this, even if they are actually in sinus rhythm. So sometimes if you're looking at an ECG rhythm, sometimes what you might see is that this uh, PR segment here uh, actually masks the uh, Q wave. So you actually don't have a Q wave and the PR segment looks like it's directly connected to the R wave. So that might might, might look like it's missing, but you have to think that if you actually do have a QRS complex that you would have had a Q wave actually happen. So sometimes your ECG is still sinus, but it doesn't look as perfect as it does on this diagram here. The other things to note with this is to actually look at your normal time intervals. So in terms of the uh, PR interval, the PR interval is actually 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. The other time interval you're making a note of is the QRS complex, and the QRS complex is less than 0.12 seconds. And then the last interval that you're looking at when you're reading ECGs is the QT interval, and the QT interval is 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. So by looking at the time intervals and also taking a look at how the normal waveforms look like in this normal ECG, when you're, we're actually looking for deviations from that. So deviations outside of these uh, normal time intervals and also deviations from what the normal wave actually looks like. And that's what we look at to determine and analyze what's actually going on with the heart. So there's a few things to note for ECGs regarding the graph paper that the ECG is actually printed on. The first thing I'm gonna do is if you actually look at the top left diagram on this screen, uh, I'm actually going to highlight in red here what we refer to as a large box. So what I've highlighted is in red is the large box, and if you go to the bottom left diagram, one large box is equal to 0.2 seconds. Within each of the large boxes, there's actually five small boxes, and each of the small boxes is actually equating to 0.04 seconds of time. So what we're actually doing with the large box is if you actually take each uh, five large boxes, you'll actually be able to calculate uh, what one second is. So that's five large boxes. And then if you're actually counting out 15 large boxes, this gives you three seconds. And then what you're actually going to be doing is counting out 30 large boxes, which will give you an ECG rhythm over six seconds. So the reason that we're actually looking at a six second strip is because we can actually take that 
and by looking at the number of R waves uh, within six seconds for the, ventric uh, for the ventricular depolarization and multiplying the number of R waves in six seconds by 10, we can actually figure out what the heart rate is over a one minute period. So in, when you actually look at your ECG graph paper, some of your graph paper, if you're looking at the top left diagram, actually has hash marks that are already on the graph paper that will help you identify uh, 15 boxes. So you'd actually look at two hash marks and then be able to find out very easily uh, where the 30 boxes would lie in terms of finding out your six seconds. However, in some cases, the graph paper actually doesn't have uh, hash marks on it. So in this case, you'd actually be counting out uh, 30 large boxes to get your six second strip. We're only looking at the six second strip, so anything that happens before or after the strip of six seconds does not actually matter, and we're not actually looking at that. So just analyzing the rhythm over a six second period to see what, the, what it does over a one minute period if you multiply by 10 for heart rate. Other things that you'd actually be looking for uh, would be looking at the actual small boxes to determine uh, whether or not your actual waves fall within the designated normal time frames. So I'll give you an example. And if you look at the bottom left diagram, uh, for the QRS complex, which is the ventricular depolarization, you already know that that normal range for that should fall between 0 0.06 seconds to 0.12 seconds. So if I'm actually looking at uh, for the maximum amount of time for the uh, QRS complex to go, I'm actually counting out three of the small boxes. So three times 0 0.04 seconds gives me 0.12 seconds. So you're expecting that your QRS complex should fall between those three small boxes. So essentially, we're actually doing that for your PR interval, your QRS complex, and your QT interval to determine well, the length of time specifically that the ECG is reading. And from that, we can note deviations outside of the norm. Uh, how we do this is if you actually look at the top right corner of the screen, you'll actually see a pair of calipers. And we can actually use calipers to pinpoint specifically the amount of time that we need. There are other ways that you can do this. Uh, in one of the videos where we actually demonstrate a full ECG reading, the instructor there actually uses a piece of paper and she just marks off on the piece of paper uh, where the QRS complex falls or the R wave falls or the P wave falls to see if there's a regularity between the pattern. So some of the things that we're actually looking at, uh, we're actually comparing the P wave and seeing if there's one P wave for every QRS complex. So essentially, if there's one atrial depolarization for every ventricular depolarization. Uh, of course, I had mentioned we're looking at the PR interval in terms of the overall time length, and PR interval uh, falls between 0.12 seconds or 0.2 seconds. And again, uh, 0.2 seconds is, is one equates to one large box. And then, of course, we are also looking at the QT interval. And then other things we'd be looking at would be the ST segment. And the reason why we're looking at the ST segment is just to determine whether or not there's any issues that might indicate something like a myocardial infarction, for example. So that's the overall takeaway from this is that we're analyzing six second strips. So we're counting out 30 boxes, large boxes for that. So some of the things that we're looking at when we actually are examining the ECGs is if you actually look at the top diagram, you're actually identifying whether or not there is a consistent amount of time between your P waves. So that would be the atrial depolarization. So now I'm actually going to be comparing all the P waves and seeing if they're actually spaced evenly apart, because in a normal ECG rhythm, they should be roughly the same time length apart. And you can also do the same for the R waves that represent the QRS complex and ventricular depolarization. So whether or not there's actually a, 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 the same amount of time between the R waves. If you actually take that and actually look down to the uh, bottom diagram there, you can actually see that if you look at the diagram and you take a look at the first three seconds of your six second strip, the actual uh, time length between the R waves actually changes. So there's more time that passes between the R waves in the first part of the three seconds. But if you actually take a look at the last three seconds of the six second strip on the bottom diagram, you can actually see that the time length is actually a little bit short. So that tells you that there is an irregularity in the actual rhythm, particularly with the ventricles here that I'm looking at. And you can probably do the same 
or you should be doing the same for the P wave as well to determine any irregularities with the uh, time length there. In terms of determining the heart rate, there's actually two methods to determine the heart rate. The first method is the method that I actually recommend the most because it is actually universally applicable to all ECGs. And that's actually taking your six second strip and then counting how many R waves are in between the six seconds. So, and then multiplying by 10 to get the heart rate. So if I was to do that on the bottom diagram here in six seconds, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And multiply by 10, you're looking at a rough heart rate of 70 beats per minute in over that six second strip. So 70 beats per minute would be what you're looking at. And the reason why this works really well is that it actually works for uh, both irregular heart rhythms and regular rhythms. The other method that you actually have is actually something called the 300 method. The reason we're actually using 300 is because in a one minute time period, there's actually 300 large boxes. So if I was to do that on the top diagram, uh, I would actually be counting out how many large boxes there are between my R waves. So there's one box, two, three, four, and five. So if I was to give that a rough estimate, and in some cases you'd have to estimate because some of the, your boxes might not be perfectly even on five, it might be 5.2 or 5.4, so that might vary a little bit. But in this case, I've got roughly five boxes. And if you take 300 and divide by five large boxes, you'll get a rough heart rate of 60 beats per minute. To use the same uh, 10 second, uh, uh, I guess, the counting of the uh, number of R waves within a six second period multiplied by 10, I was to use that same method on the top strip. I've got my hash marks for six seconds. And then in this case, I'd be counting out how many uh, R waves there are in the six seconds. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, and six in six seconds multiplied by 10, which also gives me a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So you can use the 300 method, which got me 60 beats per minute, and also the counting the individual R waves in the six second multiplied by 10, and that also came out to the same result. Okay. So again, uh, either method works. However, the best me method that I would recommend is going to the actual counting R waves and multiplying by 10, because again, that works for irregular and regular heart rhythms. So this slide actually shows some problems with the ECG strips. Uh, the first diagram up top is actually artifact or interference, or there might be some movement or tremor while the ECG is actually being read. Uh, sometimes there's interference in terms of improper grounding of the equipment or related to other uh, electronic equipment in other rooms. Uh, the bottom diagram is actually what we'd call a wandering baseline, and that's actually due to movement of the chest wall during respiration, and sometimes that's also something related to uh, poor placement of the ECG lead. So you're actually detecting the respirations of the patient rather than their consistent heart rhythm. So the other things that might affect that is if the skin is dirty or if there's oil or hair on the skin, or also if the electrode that you're using for attachment to the patient is actually dried out, so it's not conducting properly. So those would be just some things to be aware of in terms of diagnosing problems with your ECG strip if you're seeing some of these uh, rhythms or patterns that you're actually seeing in this slide here. So for the overall steps to interpret your ECG reading, the first thing that we'll actually do is take a look at the ventricular rate. Now with the ECG, we can also calculate the atrial rate if needed, but because the ventricle is what we need to perfuse the rest of our body, that's probably the most important rate to, to determine. Uh, we will look at the P waves in terms of the atrial uh, depolarization to see if they're present, uh, what their rate is, and also the overall morphology if, it, if they look abnormal. Uh, we do want to see that one, there's one P wave for every QRS complex, and hopefully that is a one-to-one -one relationship in a normal ECG. We will look at the QRS complex for ventricular depolarization to see if it's actually present. Uh, we'll also examine whether or not it's deflected above or below the isoelectric line to see if there's any abnormalities of that. And then also, we're actually looking to see, of course, the time measurement, which is, which is 0.06 to 0.12 seconds. So that is 1.5 to 3 small boxes. And remember that the small boxes are 0.04 seconds. And then we'll also do the measurement for the PR interval. And sometimes when we're looking at the PR interval, 
for actually determining whether there's a conduction problem between your uh, AV node. And then we'll also take a look at the QT interval as well and measure that. The other thing that uh, is not listed here, but we do look at, is we actually will take a look at the ST segment. As I identified earlier, it might represent, if it's elevated, it might represent a myocardial infarction of some type. However, what we're actually looking for is if that returns to baseline or if it returns to the uh, isoelectric line. So there is a video of an ECG interpretation as an example done by one of our instructors. And if you actually uh, click on the link, and I will actually also paste the link into the uh, description of this video as well, so that you can actually take a look at that and have a little bit more of an example of a full ECG interpretation. So that concludes our overview of the ECG analysis. Uh, what we will do in class is analyze some of the common rhythms and discuss their associated nursing interventions. The only other thing to remember is that with ECG monitoring, you will nurse the patient, not the monitor. So take a look at what your patient is presenting with and then use the ECG as a supplement to help you diagnose and figure out what's going on with the patient. So it's patient-centered always. Thank you.